today. I look forward to hearing your questions um, at the end of our presentation. And uh, please, um, if, you, if you have questions or if you're just looking for more information, there will be time at the end to do that. So my name is Susan Hellyer. I'm the Director of Residential Experience here at NMU. We've got a number of residences on campus, each of which offer a different lifestyle and a different uh, sort of amenity, but they're all about living, learning and growing together in a supportive community. Yeah, that's good, we'll stick there for a Thank moment. You. Um, you can see from this slide that there's a range of um, amenities that are available for study and for building social connections on campus. What we really focus on is making sure that wherever you're living on campus, whether it's in a apartment style residence, whether it's in a communal living, um, bedrooms off corridor residence, whether it's in a um, undergraduate and postgraduate shared residence, whether it's in a place where it's just a specialist residence for postgraduate students, that you get access to things like computer rooms, shared study spaces, common areas for social interactions, places where you can do gaming or to host events. Um, and you will see for some places we have rooftop gardens, some places have gyms and music rooms, and all of the places that we have to live on campus have disability accessible bedrooms or apartments so that we can be an all abilities community. One of the things that people are most interested in um, in their first year of coming to campus, at the, uh, coming to study at the ANU, is thinking about what will be available in terms of academic support and in terms of pastoral care. Now pastoral care is all about having the right support to do well, to settle in, to get help when uh, things aren't going to plan and to work with people on the kinds of problems that are really um, very common in uh, an undergraduate's life but often can be quite stressful. There are people in all of the residences both staff and peer, peer support um, student leaders who can help across all of the kinds of things that uh, people who are first transitioning to a residence um, uh, need support to settle in and to do well in their academic program. We also have a really strong focus on ensuring safety and well-being for students and that part of that is done through our security services. We have a very strong focus on COVID safety. As you can imagine, we've been through a really tough year last year, like all of you, um, but we've got our COVID safe practices down pat. Um, and we've also got a really COVID safe campus where people can come and be, be COVID safe, but actually really actively participating in a, in a strong um, and vibrant community life. When things do go wrong, we have access to 24 hour security personnel who can come in and help us. Sometimes that's about things like somebody having a first aid um, crisis and they need some support around that. And sometimes it's about people feeling unsafe. Uh, they are right there for us to make sure that students get all that they need to do well um, and to feel safe in their home on campus. Next slide please. You can see, um, actually go back one. Lovely. Um, oh, sorry, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> They're playing tricky, the slide. You can see we do have a really large um, community of, um, on campus. We've got over 5,400 places, um, just under um, around 55% in a normal year are people who come from around Australia and about 45% are people who come from around the world. Um, our around the world numbers are not as strong at the moment because a number of people um, needed to go home last year or um, were not able to arrive. We are really keen on rebuilding our um, community from people from all over the world because we know that's one of the things that students really enjoy about living in on-campus accommodation is being part of a really diverse community where there's lots of different cultures and lots of different lifestyles all mixing together. We work really hard on creating a balance in our communities of students who come from the cities, but also people who come from regional, remote or rural areas. 
We also try to make sure there's a good mix of people that are new to the campus, first year, um, first year at university or first year in a residence, and people who've lived in residences before and can be part of your peer support and your leadership team. You're able to live in communities that have either a mix of undergraduate and postgraduate students, uh, but there are also some specialist postgraduate communities for those students who are coming when they are, um, are later in life and are, and are um, involved in postgraduate study and research. So there's, there's options for different people at different stages of their lives. One of the things um, students often wonder about is which accommodation will work best for you. Um, there, are, there are some really valuable um, videos available on our website. You can see the link down there in the uh, bottom left hand corner of the presentation. Really encourage you to go onto that link where some students will um, walk you through the residences where they've loved living and to give you a sense of what they think are the um, great things about living in that residence. Um, you can also uh, go onto the ANU website and have a look, there are pictures there. We're constantly updating our um, accommodation web pages. So there are um, new information and new pictures come up on there um, over the next few months. So you'll be able to check in there. I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, um, Catherine, who um, can talk to you about once you've had a bit of a think about coming to campus, what might be the sorts of um, steps you need to take to start to tell us where you'd like to live and to um, provide us with all the information we need to consider your application. Thanks, Susan. Um, hi, everyone. So yes, as Susan said, just going to talk you through the steps um, of your application through the direct entry portal. So if you've already made your application, thank you for that. Uh, for those that haven't, I'll just uh, go through those steps with you. So when you log on to the direct entry portal and you complete your academic um, component of the application, you will be asked if you'd like to be um, to have your accommodation on campus. And we certainly hope that you select that option. When you get there, you'll just have to answer a couple of short questions. Um, one of those will be selecting a preference of residence and as Susan said, this is really a great time to do some homework prior to that so that you sort of really know all the different styles that we have on offer here and also the different tariffs that um, you're looking at. So it's a good way to start to thinking about your budget and what's going to fit for you. So do take the time before you start. We have a lot of things for you to choose from. Um, we certainly can't guarantee preferences, but we will certainly work as hard as we can to get you your preference. And if we can't, it'll be the closest lifestyle choice that we can offer you at the same time. So that is if you choose a catered residence and we have um, a place not available in that particular residence, we'll look at another catered option for you or perhaps flexi catered. So just prepare yourself for all different living styles. And also, as I said, the budgets will vary slightly. So it's good to make yourself aware of those. So the preference will be something that you'll select in this um, section of your application. Um, you'll also be asked if you have any medical or special needs. I really encourage you to disclose anything there that you'd like us to know. We use this in confidence and only use it to help you get the best place possible. So please don't hesitate to put anything down. Um, as I said, it is com in, it's confidential, but we, you know, we want to get you the best situation that we can. We should just reinforce that that's, we wouldn't in any way exclude people no, from the information that that's they provide. Right. And it's a really good point to make because some people are a little bit shy to put something thinking that may go against them, but I can assure you it's not. Um, we don't want you to come um, and find out that we could have you know, organised a better room for you or better support um, because you haven't put that down. So please do that. Um, also, when you're looking at the residents in the drop down, when you select anything, you'll see indicative tariffs are showing at the moment and they're for 2021. Um, when our 2022 tariffs have been approved, they will be on our website later in the year and you'll be able to look at those. But this does give you, um, you know, a baseline to start from to realise what, you know, prices that you are looking at. We should say for the tariffs, the tariffs are about half the rent for the room and the facilities. And it's about half for the kind of services that you get in the room, which might be your data, your electricity, your heating, 
um, but also all the pastoral care, security and um, academic support services. Yeah. So it's about half-half in most of the residences and the ones that are catered, yeah, there's also the top-up, which is the um, food component of yeah. the tariffs. Certainly. So have a look at those. Um, so you'll select your preference. As I said, you put down any medical special needs if you have those. Um, and then you'll also, at the moment, you'll see a section on um, something called NRAS, which is the National Rental Affordability Scheme. Now, that scheme won't be in play when you come next year, but we are required to still ask that question because we have applications open for people that are coming in semester two, and we still have to show that on our website. So what I would just say to you there is, firstly, you can still make a choice if you choose the NRAS option, that's going to offer you Lena Campbell or Warrnambool. But remember, if you do select that, the tariff that you're seeing there is the tariff that currently is. It wouldn't mean that there'd be any less if you went under that scheme. It's just saying that if you went into one of those rooms, that you are under the income that we list, um, which is $55,000 in the previous year, and I'm sure that wouldn't affect you. The other part of the NRAS section that we are required to ask is the income details. When you get to that page, you can leave all of those figures at zero and continue on because it will not affect you at this stage. So as I said, we do have to have it there um, because of our semester two applications, but you can just move through that section by leaving the income at zero. So that's what all you're gonna to have to put in at that stage, and then you'll continue on and finish your direct entry application if you're choosing to um, you know, ask for a scholarship, and then you could submit the whole application. From there, what's going to happen and um, is that when the applications close, which is the 24th of May, um, from there, um, all the normal you know, academic reviews will be done. And when the early offers are released, um, they're gonna come out on the 9th of August. So that's where you'll see where you've been offered to and you'll get an email from us. But something that's really important to note is when your early offer is released, please remember to accept all components of it. So when it comes out, you'll respond to your academic component of that offer, but remember to move on through to accommodation if that's applicable and onto the scholarship section. By just responding to the academic offer, that doesn't flow onto the other two. So it's important that you follow each one that you want to respond to. Once you respond to our accommodation component, you're going to receive an email from us that's going to tell you where you're going to be living in 2022. Um, and just some more information at that stage. You're not going to be required to pay anything or to sign anything at that particular time, but we'll use that as an opportunity to give some information, um, you know, remind you about dates, etc. cetera. Um, and again, you're always at any stage of the process more than welcome to contact us by email or phone if there's anything you wish to discuss. Now, you'll have up until the 6th of September to um, respond, accept that accommodation, which means you want to continue on to receive your final offer at the end of the year, and we hope you do that. When your final confirmed offer is released, that will be on the 23rd of December for most of you. Some may be released on the 7th of January if you're getting IB results. So again, that's when, this is sort of the more um, the important part of the process that you really need to sort of think about with timelines. Your accommodation offer, your formal accommodation offer will be released at that stage. And that's gonna show you your contract. It's gonna list your check-in dates, check-out dates that are bound in that contract and also the acceptance fees that you'll be required to pay to secure your offer. So depending on the location you go, um, that can vary, of course, between catered, self-catered, flexi-catered, but basically you're gonna be asked for a refundable deposit, a resident committee fee, a registration fee, and two weeks rent in advance based on the location that you've been living. So there will be a fairly straightforward process where you'll go online, you'll accept your accommodation offer, receive your occupancy agreement, and then go to a page where you'll pay the, the required acceptance fees. Again, um, at any stage, if you're having difficulty with the process um, or you have any questions around that prior to accepting, please reach out to us so that we can, you know, step through those um, worries or questions or assistance with you. Do you want to say, what's an occupancy agreement? Yeah, so that's going to be like your... Um, your contract, rental contract, if you like, and that's the terms and conditions that's made up of your handbook, schedule of fees, um, and that's going to be what you'll agree to from the actual date to the end date. And they're not 
um, dates that we can change. So it's not negotiable. You know, you may accept your occupancy agreement up to, for instance, say the 15th of December. Um, you might want to leave in November to go home, but you are required to pay to the end of that contract. So please be aware of that and take the time to read all that information when you get it because you are going to be accepting a legally binding agreement at that stage. You'll have up to the 18th of January um, to finalise your acceptance for all parts of the direct entry, but for your accommodation. So please, um, again, I can't stress enough, remember to, at that point again, you are going to have to respond to all three components so that that flows on through to us. So I think for me, that's just a quick overview of those parts. It's important just to remember those dates responding to all sections when your direct entry offer is released, doing your homework prior to that so that you know all the different styles of residence we have and the varying tariffs. Um, but we certainly, you know, look forward to seeing you next year and, you know, hope that we can answer some questions for you today around that. Great, thanks Cathy. Well, open for questions now if people have any um other things that they were wondering about or anything you want to follow up on what we've already talked about today. So maybe while we're just waiting for some questions, um, I could just briefly touch, like Susan talked about, you know, we have different types of residents and we certainly do, and you'll see that on the website. So we have catered, which is 21 meals per week. Um, we have flexi catered, that's a great option, that's 16 meals per week. So if you don't want full catering, that's a really good option. And then self catered where obviously you cook your own meals. And styles vary, um, but everyone has their own single lockable room. Um, and if you're in self catered, then you would share the facilities, um, big kitchens on the ground floor. You share our unisex bathrooms on each floor, but they're again all safe lockable cubicles. Um, in the catered, again, the same situation, but meals in a dining room. And then we also have in our four lodges, Davy, King Lock, Lena, Carmel and Warrnambool, we have um, multi-share apartments, anywhere from a two to six bedroom multi-share or single self-contained studios. So, you know, you can go in, you know, they're a little bit more modern, independent style of living where you can, literally that apartment style, you'll have your own lockable room. Um, and depending on the size of the multi-share, that could be two, um, one, two bathrooms, depending on the size. So that's, you know, um, adequate facilities in there and then your kitchen area. If you feel that you require your own facilities, then certainly you've got your single studio um, that will give you that you know, kitchenette and your own bathroom. Yeah, and we know that from some of the students this year, that even in the self-catered accommodation, people kind of buy in meal services. Yeah. So yeah. things like Dinnerly or HelloFresh. Yeah. So there's quite a lot of... Um, options for yes. people um, to either be completely independent or to get some support with their food yes. supplies. Yeah, that was fantastic. Very helpful. I have got some questions now that are coming through. So how long are the occupancy agreements for? Uh, so depending again on the location you're offered, there could be anywhere from 45 weeks to 52 weeks. So our four lodges will offer 52 week contracts. Um, our ANU residents and the colleges will offer 45 week contracts. So that means in effect that the, um, your occupancy agreement starts at the beginning of February and the um, O week on campus is usually uh, mid-February. So you've got a couple of weeks before O week on campus to settle in and then there's a couple of weeks after the end of exams um, at the end of the year for, for you to, um, to kind of finish up the year for those 45 week yep. contracts. The 52 week contracts are you know a whole year so they start at the beginning of February and they end at the end of January so that gives people the chance if they've decided that they're moving to Canberra and they're looking to do for example um, an internship or to work over the summer period to, um, to build their bank account up for the next year that they can continue to live in residence. We also know with the 45 week contracts that some people then think, oh, actually I did want to stay here over the summer break and we can uh, provide people with an option for living over the summer break if they need yeah, it. Yeah, certainly. And um, when Susan said about um, the contract start date and then, you know, O week starts a little after that, but there are programs in the residence that you'll be doing 
um, you know, as a resident prior to OWEC as well. So there'll be activities and introductions um, for you when you arrive as well. Fabulous. Okay, the next question, which I'm sure most people will be interested about, what kind of scholarships are offered in the accommodation area? Is there specific scholarships offered by specific residential halls and colleges? So all the scholarships that are available will be through the, um, the general scholarships program. So don't feel like you have to look somewhere else to get that information. That will all be in that, um, the, the general scholarships applications process. What we do have in addition to those is if your financial circumstances change after you've moved in and you, you, you're in a financial emergency, we do have access to uh, what we call bursaries to support people to keep, to keep um, uh, continuing to live in the residence whilst they just work through that short term financial challenges that they have. So that's different to the scholarships um, and they would only take effect um, after you've arrived and your circumstances um, change. But just to go back, that the scholarships for accommodation are all part of the general scholarships application process. So whatever you see there is what's available. And following on from that, so there's a question here about capital scholarships. Does that affect what accommodation options are available to us? So if you've applied for a Tuckwell scholarship, one of the requirements is that you do live in on-campus accommodation. Uh, and so you should put down your preference as part of your, um, you, when you're doing your scholarship application, also do an accommodation application. Put down your preference for the residence you'd like to live in, and then that information will be taken into account should you um, be successful in, in receiving a Tuckwell scholarship. Another question, which is a little bit more detailed, but do the catered rooms have a mini fridge? <laughs> you can have a bar fridge in your room, um, and some of those residents do have um, mini fridges in there. But what I would say, um, anything like a fridge, any appliances, you need to check with the residents first before you arrive or bring anything like that. Obviously with test and tag um, issues, safety issues, they're things that you can't have in your room. Um, so prior to arriving, and once you get your offer and you know where you're going, you will, you will receive information, a welcome pack from them. That'll tell you about things to bring, what you can have in your room, but that's the time to follow up there. But certainly most of them are quite happy for you to have a small bar fridge in your room that you can keep your snacks, etc. Fabulous. Okay, this is a great question. Are we able to change our catering status throughout our time at ANU? So if you move into a, a fully catered hall, it's, it's an all or nothing. You're either in fully catered or you're, um, yeah, that, that's what you have in that hall. In the flexi catered hall, you have the option of just paying for 16 meals a week. But again, it was you stay in that hall, that will be your requirement. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that you've asked that because we have been looking at a more flexible ca catering option for people in self-catered accommodation for exactly the reason that you might want to start with a catering option, but then over time, as you um, build your confidence with um, looking after yourself and build your cooking skills, you might want to take that on doing that yourself. So we are looking at that this year. So by the time you get here next year, we, we will, um, by the time you have your offer for next year, we'll be able to talk to you about a more flexible approach if you move into a catered residence, it's it's an all or nothing arrangement. So, so yes, yeah. So if you're looking for a more flexible arrangement, mm -hmm. we would recommend you go with a self-catered option. Mm -hmm. And then there's the option of um, buying in some uh, some meal services, um, and then turning that off when you're ready to do your own thing. And I just I also think might, in, yeah, yeah, I think they might be also wondering if they can change their yes. hall and colleagues. Oh, I might just like yeah, yeah, I will okay. explain that. Yeah. So. You've also got the option, we do run what we call inter-resident transfer processes twice a semester, all being well and um, you know, everything being normal. Uh, so what that means is you certainly come in and start where you um, have been allocated to. When the transfer process opens up, all in-room residents will be notified. You will go through that process. And if you're successful, because we can't um, you know, approve every transfer, it's based on availability in other residents and demographics that we're looking at. So you can apply if you're successful, you would be approved to move for the following semester. So it's never straight away, it'd be for the following semester. So 
certainly you may start in fully catered. Um, you know, Susan said you've built your confidence, your skills, and you think it's time to, you know, you move on. So you might apply for a transfer and say, go over to one of the lodges that you'd like to go into a multi-share apartment. You've met some friends and you'd like to transfer there. So there's options for movement, certainly. Um, so you can sort of transition through those areas in the residence. Fabulous. Uh, if, if someone's got a specific question about um, one of the halls, how do you suggest that they make contact? Would you suggest they make direct contact or would you rather them to direct the accommodation services first? Um, we'd be happy to, firstly, to be contacted at, at our uni.com at anu.edu.au email, which I think is on our slide anyway that you can refer to. Um, so that might be a good start because that'll just, you know, depend on the question that you have and we'll be able to then point you in the right direction so that you don't have to go around, um, you know, in circles trying to get that answer. Lovely, thank you. Another great question. If we have food allergies, do we put them in the application part of the accommodation? And can the food be catered for students with allergies? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So as, as, as Kathy said, it's really great to provide as much information about your personal circumstances as you can, because then we can get things ready and set up and, and welcoming for you um, when you arrive. The, the catered halls are very familiar with um, working to make sure that people with food allergies still get a great catered service and are kept safe um, in that communal um, dining and communal kitchen environment. So please do tell us, but please be confident that we, we can, it, it would, there's no reason why we can't um, provide you with the kind of um, catering that you need. Someone here is wanting to ask and for you to sort of talk about the pros and cons about the catering accommodation options. Not quite sure if we want to go into that now, um, or it's something that we can answer later. But that's up to you, is it? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think the pros and cons um, you will see through those 360 videos. So I would recommend you go and have a look at those um, what we call the 360 videos. So they're videos that have been produced to show you a picture of the residence, but also there are some student um, leaders who provided you with their reflections on what, what's great about living where they are. And that will give you a real sense of the pros and cons from your perspective, because for every person has got a different uh, set of preferences, a different set of needs, and a different lifestyle you're looking for. So rather than us uh, defining that, you go on and have a look at what the students have said, and then you'll get a sense of the pros and cons for you. Wonderful. This is about preferences again. So if you don't get a preference in the residence for a single studio, so they've requested that, and they try to find, will you try to find another resident with a single studio part? I know you touched on that, yes. Catherine. So yeah. if you just want to just maybe yes, touch certainly. on that again. Yeah, yeah thanks, Clara. So yes, yeah, certainly. So in a, in a situation like that, you've asked for a, say, a single studio at Lena Carmel Lodge, and we haven't got a single studio there, then certainly we will go to the other areas that have single studios for undergraduates and we make you an offer from one of those. So we look at the closest lifestyle um, choice to match yours that we can. Um, and if we can't, we'd offer you the, the next available thing. But I'd be quite confident as far as something like a single studio, we'd be able to meet that requirement for you. It just may be in perhaps one of the other lodges. Fabulous. Uh, I'm not sure this is a question that you can answer, but it's one I think you should should hear how many places are available at each residence for new students and do returning students get a priority? So we try to create a good mix of returning and uh, new residents because we know that works for creating a strong, vibrant and healthy community. This year, we've got a lot of first years in some residences because we had such a large number of first years come to AMU this year because there were no gap year options for people and less work opportunities. So we're kind of flexible based on what happens each year. Our preference is to have uh, more returners than our first years so that there's a really strong, steady community and lots of um, experienced student leaders who can support the new students with settling into university, with um, understanding how to um, get engaged in their academic program, how to develop their study skills, but also with the right community for social um, and emotional wellbeing. 
And that doesn't mean um, in any way that you won't get accommodation, you are guaranteed accommodation. It just means that um, you may get a different um, preference of residence that we allocate you to. So that's what's really important. What we talked about is to make yourself familiar with all the different styles, um, catered, self-catered, flexi-catered, because you may be allocated to something different to what you've chosen, but they all have excellent pastoral care, academic support, a huge range of activities. So one's not really offering any more than another one. They've just got their own unique um, ethos and yes, style. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, where if anyone that you talk to, they will tell you their residence is the best. Um, and of course, mm -hmm. that's how passionate they are about it. But they all are fantastic. So Susan, as she said, you do have the returners, that's really important, but it doesn't mean that you won't get a place, you certainly will, um, but it could be just at a different location. Brilliant. If I've submitted my early application, am I able to change the accommodation I've already submitted? Um, not at this point in time. Those applications won't flow through to us um, at this point because you know this um, application period is still open and it goes into that actual system and that's going through a lot of different processes. When it comes over to us um, and offers a release, you can certainly email us at that time and we'll have some information about preference changes on the website um, once these offers are released that will sort of tell you the steps you need to take to make that request. We may not be able to um, guarantee that request, but we'll certainly look at what you're asking us um, and after we've finished the allocation and after we see, um, you know, from the early offers go out who accepts and who declines those, then we'll perhaps be in a better place to, you know, consider your um, request to us. Is there a time when it's too late to request Yeah, and that's um, yeah. something that will be on the website because as you imagine, after the early offers are released and then if we are able to move anyone around for preferences and lock those down, we won't be able to do that, you know, from late September, October, it'll be pretty much locked down at that stage because we do have returning students we have to um, look at as well. But there'll be opportunities and we'll certainly talk to you about those on the website. And that will be some information that we'll have when your early offer comes out along with some other dates. Fabulous. I think people just want a clarity with this one a little bit about the early entry program and if they have a select, selected accommodation, is there any more steps that they need to do for applying for accommodation? No. So as long as you've done that section in your early entry and you've submitted your application, that's all you need to do. Um, the most important steps from there on in is when your early offer comes out, as I've said a couple of times now, is to ensure you respond to the accommodation component. Don't just, you know, respond to the academic part where you see that. Make sure you scroll down and go to all your sections and you know, the accommodation and of course scholarships as well. So do that so that we can see that you've accepted, you wanna go ahead and get that information out to you. And then your next steps will be to do the same thing when your final office confirmed. When that comes out to you via the ASA notification, you need to follow all those steps again, but you're certainly, there's nothing else you have to do. You don't need to apply again directly onto our accommodation portal. Please don't do that. Um, just stay with what you've done in the direct entry. Wonderful. We've got two questions actually about the NRAS. So can we apply for Lena Carmel by selecting the NRAS even though the NRAS doesn't apply for next year? Yes, certainly. It's just that we had to split it up um, because they were the areas were underneath, um, under that actual um, scheme. So that's why it had to look like this um, at this point in time. So certainly, yes, um, select um, Lena Carmel. It's a, a lovely residence, self-catered, that has the multi-share, the single studios. Um, and as I said, just important to note that the tariff that you're seeing, indicative tariff for that, is as it is. It's not, um, it wouldn't be changed in any way, even if NRAS was still in play for next year. Great. And the second question, in the application process, unless I say yes for the NRAS, I can't select a residential preference. Is there a reason for this? Um, no, that's not the case. You have yes or no. If you say yes, you'll just see Lena Carmel or Warrnambool. If you say no, you're going to see all the other residents. So you've got a selection of all of them. It's just what you're choosing. So before you submit it, if you go yes, um, and you'll see the two, if you like one of those anyway, even regardless of NRAS, you could choose one. If that's not what you want, you just go no, and you'll see all the other drop downs of catered, flexi, and self catered. Brilliant. 
How is it decided? I think you've touched on this a little bit, but maybe you want to touch on it again. How is it decided who gets their first preference? We try to give us everybody their first preference. That's our goal. <laughs> so, um, but it is probably a matter of uh, once we get to that sort of September time frame, it's it's basically it's a bit random, really. Yeah, I think like the the, the bottom line to it is that we certainly look at the returners in each of the residents and then with the places that we have available because it is such a, a great diverse you know culture there we look at an even mix of um, male female domestic international students when they could join us and even courses that are going to be studied just to get a really broad um, you know section of everyone so that's what it can come down to. It can be, you know, the demographics that we're trying to meet in each area because we don't want to have a residence that's just full of all male art students and someone up there. So it's really mixed and that's why you'll have a great time in the residence because it has such diversity. Yeah. But, and, but we will make sure that you get your preference of lifestyle. Yeah, So if definitely. you've picked an apartment living place, we'll yes. make sure you get yeah. apartment living. If you've picked catered, we'll, we'll make sure you get catered. And if you pick self-catered or flexi-catered, we'll, we'll make sure you've got that link. Brilliant. This is a lovely one to follow on. Can we choose who we share our apartments with? Um, what you can do is if you're going to um, ask for a multi-share apartment, once you put that in, you can um, email us. Once your offer is released, your early offer, and if you know, you've been allocated to a multi-share, you can certainly email us um, with the request, there's two parts to that. One, again, we can't always guarantee that because if you imagine in the multi-share apartments, we could already have returning students in that um, to give us that um, balance. Um, you know, and if, if you're going into a five-bedroom multi-share and there's already four returners, you know, there's not going to be room for your friends to go in as well. But they will certainly look at that, um, our colleagues at, at the lodges, to see what they can do for you. But also, too, if you want to request it, um, your friend is also going to have to request it. You know, it's a joint um, request that will have to come to us um, so that we can know that both people um, do want to go ahead with that. But again, talking about our transfer process and also internal room moves, too. Mm -hmm. So if you go into the lodges, they may not be able to do that right at the start. But then um, as the semester progresses and you talk to staff, um, they're really good with room moves. And, you know, you sort of make it known we both like to go here and they can shuffle people around once people are, you know, have that movement and everyone, you know, is sort of moving in, moving out, and you know where they're at. Lovely. Uh, it's really interesting. Do catering colleges have more socially based activities than the non catering colleges? I don't think it's it's that's what we see at all um having a shared dining room is a very particular experience um so but then again there's also shared kitchens that can be an incredibly social space but i think it's about um the, the social activities that are offered are very um, diverse and frequent regardless of where you live the thing we would say, though, is having a shared dining experience where, where you know, within a two-hour period, everybody will be in there is very different if you're in an apartment where you're organising your own meals. So, but having said that, though, um, one of the social activities that happen in the apartment living lodges are things like the Sunday morning brunch that is a whole community um, shared activity. So there are, there are ways of... Um, different residences with different lifestyles, having the same kind of social environment to build your connections and to build your support. Mm. This is a really good question. If we choose to be self-catered, it appears that we get our own kitchen in our room based on the 360 images. Is this true? It depends on what self-catered residence you live in. Somewhere like um, Burton and Garen Hall, Fenner Hall, Wormbrood Hall, that's um, the style, as I said, your own single lockable room, shared facilities, and then kitchens on the ground floor where you do your know, cooking um, with your other um, residents. They're like big master chef Yeah, kitchens. they're awesome. Yeah. So there's that style, but it's in the single self-contained studios. That's where you have your own, um, you know, own facilities. So it's just a little kitchenette for you and your own bathroom. So that's in the single self-contained studios. But everywhere else, it's all the apartments. It's just exactly like an apartment. But no, 
facilitated doesn't mean your own kitchen, certainly in those particular um, styles of apartments. Thank you. Yeah. The self-catered option doesn't have an option available unless I say yes to the NRAS. Is that because this combination is not possible? So people are trying to really work out mm -hmm. what they can get with the yes and no of the yeah, As I said before, yeah. and just by saying yes, you're only just going to see the two, Lena, Carmel and Warrigal, purely because of the NRAS requirement that we have to have in the application at this point. Um, but if you say no, you're going to see all the other ones. You're going to see all the self-catered, um, so Burton and Garen, Fenner, Wormbrun, you'll see all the catered, um, and you'll see right. So it's just simply a case of clicking between the two and having a look. So would you recommend people start by clicking no, yeah, and then they get to see yeah. everything, yeah. and then when they click yes, they can see what's on the short list. Absolutely. Yeah. And I've done, I've been through the application myself to make myself familiar to what you're seeing, and I've, I've done exactly that. I've done yes and gone through. I haven't submitted it. I've gone back, had another look, changed a few things. Yep. Okay, and then when you, you know, you're really sure, and even before you submit um, your direct entry application, get right to the end, you'll review all your academic um, preferences, you'll see the scholarships that you've said, you know, yes to, to be considered for, you'll see your accommodation, where you've chosen, so review all of that, and that's when you, if you're happy with it, that's when you submit it. Oh, that's perfect, that's wonderful. There's just, is another question, and I wonder if you could just speak about the age limits, and if there is a minimum age limit in, the, in living in the residence, and just supporting, I suppose, of younger students. Yeah, so our, our um, current arrangements are that you need to be 17 when you move in. Um, some people turn 18 early on in first semester and some people turn 18 much later in the year, but you do need to be 17 to move in. If you are younger than that and you're looking to come into on-campus accommodation, I would recommend you make contact through the uni.com uh, email address and we can start to talk with you about what your options are. Yeah. There are people who get very early entry to the university um, who have um, um, academic reasons to want to come to university at a much younger age. And we, we can work with people about what their accommodation options are. But in general, need to be 17 to move in. And what we do do is provide for anyone who is not yet 18, we have some different um, care and support arrangements in recognition of the fact that they're not quite at adult um, legal age yet. Uh, so that, but when you, when you get your um, welcome pack, then that information will be included in that. Fabulous, well, we don't have any more questions. Um, we'll just wait a moment just to see if something else comes up. Is there anything that you'd like to touch on again, Susan or Catherine, about Anything that you'd like to focus before we say uh, farewell? I'd just like to encourage everyone, whether you've submitted your application or you're still working through that, um, please, if you need any assistance in any way, um, just email us at the uni.com email address or call us and, you know, we're all there to help you, you know, go through that, answer questions if it hasn't been clear today or something else that you think about. Um, but please, you certainly reach out because um, we want to make this as, um, the best experience for you that we can. Lovely. Well, I think that's really it. There's no more questions sitting here. Let me just turn on my video to say farewell. Thank you so much, Susan and Catherine, for that informative, wonderful information. I always seem to learn something as well, so thank you so much. Um, just wanted to highlight that we will be having webinars every Wednesday until the 24th of May. So over the whole period that our application, rep application um, is open, we'll be able to, there's an amazing range, which is student panels about the direct application in the sense of the program admissions, another one about um, accommodation. So um, you'll have lots of opportunities to speak and, and, and um, ask questions directly to our teams and saying that this this uh, session has been recorded, so you'll be able to also revisit this and, um, and look at the presentation again and revisit the questions. Um, please reach out, as Susan and Catherine have said, to the accommodation services team. They're there for you to support. Also, you're more than welcome to reach out to us. You have our details from registering. 
for this uh, webinar. So student.recruitment at anu.edu.au and we can look after you. And if we don't know, we know who to ask. So thank you everyone for being here today um, and please have an enjoyable evening and we look forward to seeing you on campus.